Okay, so carry on with our uh, incestuous theme. <laughs> our next speaker is the University of um, Exeter in Falmouth, Cornwall campus, uh, where he recently moved. Um, in the previous life, he was a, a postdoc in uh, Sheffield for a while, and um, he did some fantastic analyses on our long-term data using those complicated statistical models I mentioned a bit uh, this morning. And um, following that, he moved on to become a lecturer in uh, Plymouth, and where he continued his secret research, and um, he, had, in the last few years, has been. Um, working on gannets on grasso, uh, which I think is going to be what he's yeah. talking about. Yeah, so I've not this exactly. Is it working? Thank you, Ben. Um, so this pisses me on go slow for some reason. This is a really close up shot of the gannet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it works a minute ago. Has anybody got any kind of insight into this? Yeah, it's a bit of a problem. further offshore from, from Scoma and Skokum and heading off to that, um, what looks from the distance somewhat like to me a, an iceberg or a kind of a large pavlova sitting out off the coast of, of Skoma, which is just an island covered in, in, in this charismatic species, the gannet. Now I don't think there's any point in me going into any great introductions about gannets to people in this room, but very, very briefly, this is one, clearly one of the most conspicuous components of the seabird assemblage in the North Atlantic. Um, with a global population of something like 400,000 pairs. And significantly, around about 10% of those nest on, on grass. It's the third largest gallantry in the UK, but clearly of national and international significance. <coughs> it's designated an SPA, um, and hopefully in the coming months, there may be a, a, a seaward extension of that SPA um, in much the same way as we propose for Skoma, Skokum, and also Barty and Abadaran. Now, kind of in contrast to some of the talks we've been hearing today, the, the gannet's very much a, a good news story. These are sort of poster boys of success in the seabird world. There's been a, an almost exponential increase in the population over the last 100 years or so, and there's no real evidence that this, this increase is, is abating. And so, some of you might think, well, okay, well, what's the point of monitoring a species that's doing, doing so well? But of course, we need to monitor species that are, that are um, thriving rather than just focusing on those that are in, in a sorry plight. But also I think it's important to, to bear in mind that monitoring needs to be about addressing and recognising problems and kind of looking forward. And for gallants there may be some, some trouble on the horizon. We've already heard from Tom today that there are changes in the, stru in the structure of the fish assemblage um, in the waters around the UK and that may have consequences for gallants. We also know that there's been a, a, a vast increase in the number of offshore renewable developments around the UK, and gannets may be particularly prone to risk of um, collision with these devices because of the, the altitude at which they fly, and also they're not particularly manoeuvrable. And also this is a species that has quite a strong association with fisheries. And under EU law we're going to reform the way in which we manage our fisheries, and this may have some unforeseen consequences for species like gannets. Now, partly because of logistics, the conventional monitoring that we've been hearing a lot about today, setting aside the kind of cool thermal imaging stuff, 
Um, it's been all about very, very detailed individual based studies. Like Grassland, I know many people in this room have been out there, but for those of you who haven't, it's not a very easy place to get to. And there's no formal landing site, so we're always relying on quite a nice weather window to actually work there safely. And so actually, the, whilst it would be fantastic to have a very, very detailed individual based study on grass, and that's really very unlikely in the foreseeable future. So kind of partly by necessity, we've We've, we've adopted a rather different approach to monitoring, um, and that's making the use of, of tracking technology. Now, I'm sure many people in this room won't, will, be, will be more than well aware that biologging as, a, as a, an emergent science is something that's, that's growing very, very rapidly. So this is the, the use of small devices attached to free-living animals to study their behavior and distribution. There's been three key developments in this field that's made it so successful in the, in the last few years. And the first is the development of a wide array of sensors that are of sufficient size and sufficiently robust that we can now attach them to free living species like gannets with a relatively, well, well certainly minimal level of impact, or certainly that's the, the, the perceived wisdom. And these sensors are very diverse, and I'm not going into what they are, but they can give us information on, for example, fine scale location, we've heard about the geolocation work which gives us much more broad scale information about where animals go. We can also use other sensors like time depth recorders, um, devices that record temperature, audio files, still cameras, video cameras, there's a whole kind of plethora of different devices that we can attach to these animals and it gives a very, very broad landscape of, um, of their behaviour. The other key development is, is the emergence of appropriate analytical tools. These devices are great, but they generate loads and loads of data. So one of the issues you have is you, you have these screens of data and you kind of think, well, where do I start here? There's no, uh, we can now handle those data in such a way that we can actually pick out the biological signal from this kind of potentially quite noisy environment. And also overcome some of the typical problems that these sort of data encounter, which is that you're essentially measuring the same animal on repeat occasions. And there's issues to do with spatial and temporal autocorrelation. These are kind of statistical artifacts that just mean it's quite difficult to use data in a simplistic way. But we now have tools that can overcome many of these problems. And the other thing is that Chris mentioned earlier on that, that tracking is expensive, and it is in, in one level. And certainly when we first started tracking gametes in 2006, we were paying about £1,000 for the GPS models we were using. We're using effectively the same devices now, and they cost about £30 per unit. So there's been a really massive change in the cost of these devices, and that's really revolutionised what this, the sort of things we can do. We can now conduct studies with sample sizes that are of sufficient size that we can actually start drawing some really robust biological inference. So essentially what I'm going to do today is just run through a bit of a kind of a whistle-stop tour of some of the tracking work we've been doing with the grass zone gannets over the last few years. As I said, we started there in 2006. Um, and since then, we've, we've deployed around about 300 GPS loggers on gannets, only when they've been um, rearing their chicks. Um, gannets are quite, are quite sensitive when they're on eggs, and they're prone to, to either knocking eggs out of the nest or gulls coming in to sit in the eggs. So we've only done this work when they're on quite large chicks. Um, and they just reveal some very, very basic patterns, which are quite an important first step in terms of understanding um, and, and planning monitoring. So for example, what you find is there's a there's kind of core foraging areas that the gannets from grass have used to the south and the west of the island. Very, very few heading north into the into the Irish Sea. We can increase the level of complexity, and so for instance, we have a large number of these birds that also have time depth recorders. So we can look at the distribution of these birds' dives. Um, and what you find is the vast majority of gannets that dive are using the first two to three meters of the water column. So these these um, these blue dots are these are shallow dives, but, they, but occasionally these, these gannets are diving to quite deep depths, up to 20 meters in the water column. So this is the first kind of entry level bit of tracking. It tells us roughly where birds are going and the kind of things they're doing when they get there. We can take this a little bit further. We can start looking at um, tracking at the individual level. We can ask questions about what gannets do, not just at the population level, but at the individual level. And one of the things that's quite clear is that not all gannets are equal. They do quite a, quite a wide range of different things. And those behaviours seem to be very, very consistent both within and among years. This is some uh, tracking data from four individual gannets from Grasshoe. And each of them has got four repeat 
foraging trips in the same year. Um, they've just been selected at random to, to be illustrative. Um, we've got a blue bird that repeatedly heads up into the Irish Sea, um, a kind of a, a green bird that heads into the Bristol Channel. This red bird heads repeatedly to the north coast of Cornwall. And this other bird here heads over to, towards the, the Celtic Deep. And these patterns you don't just find at islands like grass, and we've done some work elsewhere. And you find that this is quite a consistent pattern. The gannets seem to know where they're going, and they tend to be very, very repeatable in terms of their foraging locations, and also the routes they take when they get there, which might also have implications in terms of monitoring, in terms of where you might house, for example, a wind farm. We then also want to ask questions about why are these birds going repeatedly to these same sites? And an obvious candidate is this might be something to do with the, the physical properties of the water column, the oceanography. And one of the first things we thought we'd look at were, um, was frontal activity. And this is where you have discontinuities in the, in the water column, normally in terms of temperature or salinity or perhaps chlorophyll. And you can sometimes see these, these um, frontal features, they um, bioaccumulate detritus in the, in, the, in the water column. And we think these areas might be quite important foraging grounds for pelagic seabirds, because they not only are good for primary productivity, but they also entrain zooplankton and fish in, in a relatively narrow area. And this is a kind of stereotypical foraging trip of a gannet. So it's a little bit small, but grass home is the asterisk here. This bird heads out on a, on a commute, so it knows where it's going. It's flying in an almost straight line, and it's flying very, very quickly. And then at this point of the, of the foraging trip, its behavior changes. It slows down and it starts turning an awful lot. And it embarks in these circles here mark its core foraging areas that we call area-restricted searching. And what we did, we asked what conditions do you find area restricted searches under? Are they um, related to frontal activity? <laughs> and of course, the Celtic Sea is, is, um, is a very, very active region in terms of frontal activity. Just to um, briefly talk you through this, these red areas are where the water is stratified. So there's a, there's a big wedge of warm water sitting on top of the water column. And these purple areas are where the water is mixed. And these fronts are the interface between these stratified and mixed waters. And we think these are the areas that are particularly productive and might be good foraging grounds for gannets. And well, you find two things. First of all, if you look at frontal activity in almost real time, it's not a very good predictor of where gannets go. They don't just queue into these fronts. But if you look at persistent fronts, in other words, these areas that last for days or weeks, Gannets are twice as likely to engage in these, um, these areas which are search behaviours in these uh, high frontal areas compared to low frontal areas here. And therefore we think that we can explain this consistency in their foraging areas because these frontal zones are quite predictable in time and space. So we can start to understand something about not only where these birds go but how they use the environment and why we find them where we find them. Now we can also take this a little bit further, and this is somewhat underexplored, but we, we think that tracking might be quite useful as a monitoring tool. So of course, we know that seabird populations can be quite slow to change over time. And as a consequence, we can sometimes lose signal when we're looking for the impacts of environmental change. So maybe when we look at how hard birds are working in terms of their foraging effort, this might be quite a sensitive way to monitor changes in the marine environment. And simply, this is a comparison of, of um, tracking data across multiple years. The, um, these are tracks for, for multiple individuals. The blue tracks are um, imaginative, that, that's the males, and the pinks, females. In 2010, males and females seem to be doing more or less the same thing. In 2011, that changes somewhat. Females are traveling really quite long distances, and the males apparently not. And in 2012, it's rather similar to 2010. We can kind of summarize all that and just look at the mean area covered by males and females in these different years. And what you can see here is that 2010 and 2012, males and females are doing very, very similar things. But you have this interesting situation in 2011 where females are traveling really long distances, but males are traveling really, really short distances. Now, I don't know why that is. We haven't really explored that. But the, the, the idea here is that we could use this as a monitoring tool to understand how these animals are responding to change. How do you have time for that?
I was never that confident it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's just going really slowly. Um, so the other thing we can do is I mentioned fisheries as being potentially important. So we can use this tracking data from Gannett to monitor the impact of reform in the way in which we manage our fisheries. And we can do that, first of all, by tracking Gannett's at the same time that we track fisheries. Now, Tom mentioned earlier on that many fishing boats, or fishing boats above a certain size, by law must carry um, a GPS logger. And we did it as a first pass. We asked the question whether Gannett's are foraging in the same areas as fishing boats are. The answer to that question is yes. Um, I'll just briefly talk you through this. On this left-hand figure, this is a foraging trip from a single gannet, but color-coded by speed. So it leaves the colony in a more or less straight line. It's hitting up to 80 kilometers an hour, and it forms this kind of figure of eight, slowing down periodically and then heading quite quickly back to the colony. The figure on the right is the same bird, but with the location of fishing vessels in a 24-hour period. And the red dots are where there's a match between where the bird is and where the fishing vessels are. And what you can see here is that where there's a match where these red dots occur, this bird tends to slow down and have a much more tortuous flight. So this bird is clearly interacting with fishing vessels in some way. You might think, well, actually, that's just because fishing boats and gannets are targeting the same thing. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case, because when we look at what these gannets are bringing back, they often regurgitate when you're handling them. These guys regurgitate all sorts of different things from garfish to mackerel to, to sprat, but also lots of demersal species like haddock. And often these guys are regurgitating very, very large haddock without their heads. Unless there's something really weird going on, um, these are almost certainly discards that these birds obtain from fishing boats. So as a first pass, we can tell something about these gannets interacting with fishing boats. We can then also ask other questions, though, for example, what's the footprint of a fishing boat? So a fishing boat, we think of as a single point in space and time, but of course that has a visual um, footprint. And what is that visual footprint for a species like a gannet? Well, what we can do is we can look at the probability of a gannet switching from this commuting flight to a foraging flight, and we can relate that to the distance to the nearest vessel. So this is the probability of switching, if you look at the dark symbols, this is switching from a commute to a forage. This is distance to the nearest vessel. And what you can see, when a bird's close to a vessel, the probability is that it will be foraging. And this gradually decays as you move away from the fishing boat. And you find that actually the ecological footprint of a fishing boat is around about 11 kilometers. Now that's quite important in terms of marine spatial planning. We need to think about fishing boats as a, as a much larger entity than a single point in space and time. And you can do other things like identify the fact that these birds are responding to what the fishing boats are doing. They only come into fishing boats when they're actually processing catch. They won't just head to the fishing boats if they're steaming or drifting. Now that's for fishing boats that have a GPS transponder on them, but there are also lots of fishing boats out there who are actually doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing. So there's, we need to think of other ways we can try and monitor this kind of behavior. So the way in which we've done this is by attaching cameras to birds. So here's a gannet with a, a back-mounted um, digital video camera. And hopefully, so some of you may have seen this, but this is a kind of a um, a little montage of some of the video footage we've got from the backs of, of gannets. Importantly, this bird interacting with the fishing boat. Doesn't seem particularly interested, presumably because the boat's just steaming. We see lots of interactions with other gannets when these birds are far away at sea. They certainly don't spend their life on their own when they're at sea. We can look at things like diving behaviour. Some questions about how these birds use fishing boats. So, for example, what we find is that 
Not all birds interact with fishing boats to the same degree. Here's one bird on a single foraging trip. It's got four separate foraging bags shown by these open surfaces, but only one of those is associated with a photograph of a fishing boat. This bird is taking a photograph every one minute throughout its trip. Another individual here leaves the colony, head starts embarking on these foraging bags as shown by the open circles. And these black dots are photographs of fishing boats. This bird, all of its fishing bags were associated with fishing vessels. And you find actually there's quite a strong sex difference. About 30% of dives that are foraging bags and females are associated with fishing boats, whereas more than 80% of foraging bags that in males are associated with fishing vessels. And this clearly has implications for understanding the impacts of discarded forms. We've also extended this tracking to multiple colonies. So recently we did a study where we tracked gannets from multiple colonies around um, the UK, Ireland and France. And we tracked birds from 12 colonies of the 26 colonies in the region. Um, and got GPS data from nearly 200 individuals. Um, and when we tracked them more or less simultaneously, we found that Somewhat to our surprise, each of these colonies tends to have very, very distinct foraging grounds. So the, the colours of the grass over here are, are green, and the nearest colony is salty and red, and this kind of brown, kind of slightly dirty colour is where there's overlap. And actually the degree of overlap between neighbouring colonies is much less than you'd expect by chance. And this clearly has implications not only in terms of management, but also in terms of theory, in terms of understanding why Seabird colonies are where they are, and also the factors that regulate them as well. So just to kind of think where we're going with this next, let's say this is a whistle stop tool, there's lots and lots of other stuff we're doing here. But very briefly, I think there's real mileage for trying to use tracking as a monitoring tool. It's no longer a technology that's all about elite, very, very expensive, small sample size bits of information. And we can now hopefully move into, for example, linking foraging with demographics, and also think about using foraging effort as a measure of food availability. We also need to think beyond just the adult component of the population. Upwards of 50% of the fully grown population of seabirds can be comprised of immatures. So we need to know more about these birds, and gannets are quite tractable for that, because immatures tend to be, um, we can age them quite, quite easily based upon plumage. So we can look at, for example, the, the development of these different foraging behaviours and look at prospecting and dispersal and how colonies are connected with each other, if they are indeed. We're also tracking across the whole annual cycle. And another area of interest, I think, is the, is the social component of foraging. These videos suggest that gannets interact an awful lot with one another when they're at sea, and that may have implications for our understanding of change and how these animals respond to change. And also all this stuff is about, largely about 2D movement I've been showing you. Clearly we need to know how these animals move in, in three dimensions, and so we're kind of increasingly using sensors that give us information on altitude and on depth. I really have overrun a run sorry. So finally, lots of people have funded this, not as many as I'd like, but thanks to them. And <laughs> lots of people have helped as well, and they've been amazing. Without them, this sort of stuff is just not worth doing, because actually it's about people at the end of the day. So thank you.